this unit for review. Uh, it's a fairly short unit. Uh, we start off, we covered three types of radiation. Um, there are three ones that are important to what we studied. Uh, the first is alpha particles. An alpha particle is made out of two protons and two neutrons, similar to a hydrogen nucleus. Uh, it's slow moving and therefore it's fairly easy to contain. And it has a high potential for ionization, therefore it's quite dangerous. Because it's slow moving, it can't get very far before it basically peters out and loses its ionizing potential. Therefore, you have to be very close to it for it to be dangerous. Um, however, if you ingest it, that's, that's when it becomes the most dangerous. Um, because it's then it's right up against your tissue. Beta particles are made out of high-speed electrons that are created when a neutron transforms into a proton in the nucleus of an atom. When that neutron turns into a proton, it ejects a high-speed electron um, that is moving fairly fast. So it's fairly difficult to contain. It's fairly fast and it's fairly small, so it uh, can make it through quite a bit of material. Um, and it has a medium potential for ionization, therefore it is somewhat dangerous. Um, gamma rays are made out of very high frequency proton, sorry, photons, very high frequency photons, or in other words, light. It's a form of light just like visible light, um, radio waves, TV signals, x-rays, um, they're all forms of light. Gamma rays are a very, very high frequency uh, form of light. Um, that, of course, move very fast at the speed of light and are very difficult to contain. Uh, it takes quite a lot of lead to contain them. Uh, they have less potential for ionization, but due to the difficulty to contain them, they are still quite dangerous. There's some important units that we talked about. Um, the first is the Becquerel. The Becquerel measures all forms of radiation in disintegrations per second. In other words, uh, one alpha particle per second is one becquerel. One beta particle per second is one uh, becquerel. One gamma ray photon per second is one becquerel. Um, becquerels just measure the amount of radiation that's coming off of them, not necessarily how dangerous that radiation is. Uh, in order to determine that, first we need to determine the amount of energy that that radiation can give to a material. Uh, an old measure of that uh, is the rad. Um, the rad uh, is, of course, that measure of energy that is given to a, a particular material. It's called the absorbed dose, and it equals to uh, one one hundredth of a joule of energy per kilogram of material. Uh, a Newer unit, the standard unit uh, or metric unit, um, is called the gray, and it's equal to one joule of energy per kilogram of material. So if a particular radiation source um, gives one joule of energy per kilogram of material, we say that it has an absorbed dose of one gray. Now, different types of radiation, though, cause more damage to tissue than others. Therefore, it's not just how much energy is given to that kilogram of tissue, um, but also depending on the type of radiation that it is. Um, alpha particles, because of their high ability to ionize, are quite dangerous, um, and they have a very high what's called quality factor. That quality factor is just a number a number that you multiply by the absorbed dose in grays to get the absorbed dose equivalent, which is an actual measurement of how dangerous it is. Uh, and we measure that in sieverts. It's, so it's simply the gray times the quality factor gives us a sievert. That sievert then is a measure of basically how dangerous the material is. Then we went on to talk about nuclear fission and chain reactions. When an atom of certain isotopes of certain elements split into smaller atoms of different elements, a great amount of energy is released and we call this fission. So you can think of the nucleus of an atom splitting into two atoms uh, that have smaller nuclei and therefore are different atoms. They have less protons in them 
in each, therefore they are a different atom in, in unto their own. Um, and when that happens, a great amount of energy is released. An example is when uranium-235 splits into barium-144 and krypton-89, plus three free neutrons are ejected as well. Uh, this can happen spontaneously. In fact, it does happen spontaneously, but not very often. Um, certainly not often enough um, in nature to create a chain reaction. Um, therefore, we can cause it to happen. Um, if we hit the nucleus of a U-235 atom with a slow-moving neutron, um, it will fission into barium-144 and krypton-89 plus three free neutrons. If there's enough U-235 close to that fission atom, and therefore close enough to those three free neutrons, those free neutrons are going to hit new other nuclei of U-235 atoms, causing them to fission and create even more free neutrons, uh, which will continue the cycle and continue the chain reaction um, until all the U-235 atoms in the area have fission. If this happens uncontrollably, we have a nuclear explosion um, because there's a huge amount of energy released. Um, the amount of U-235 needed to ensure that the chain reaction keeps going is called the critical mass. So if you haven't hit the critical mass, um, then that chain reaction breaks down because the those free neutrons can't find other U-235 atoms and they just go shooting off into nowhere um, and keep going without hitting another U-235 atom and therefore it doesn't continue the reaction. However, if you do hit that critical mass, then you do have fission occurring, or sorry, a chain reaction occurring. Um, and that is needed in a, in a nuclear reactor. The particular type of nuclear reactor we're talk, or that we talk about in this course is called the CANDU reactor. It's a Canadian reactor, uh, Canadian design, Canadian built. It's the ones we use in Canada. Um, it uses enriched uranium. Uh, enriched uranium is simply uranium that has more U-235 isotopes than normal. So uranium that we mine in nature um, has a very small amount of U-235. Most of it is U-235. 239, no, 238, I believe it is. Um, so what they do then is they take that and they figure out a way to split the U-235 and the U-238 and then take the U-235 that they split off and they put that into a little uh, bundle um, or a little pellet and then they put a bunch of pellets in together to make a, what they call a fuel bundle. The fuel bundles then are placed into the nuclear reactor, into the core, and surrounded by deuterium or heavy water. Uh, the deuterium is used to slow down the free neutrons. Uh, if the neutrons are moving too fast when they hit the U-235 atom, they won't cause fission. It's kind of counterintuitive. You would think that if it, it has to hit it at a really fast speed to make it split, but if they're going too fast, they don't split the U-235 atoms. So you actually have to slow those neutrons down. Uh, and they use deuterium to do that. Basically what happens is the free neutrons bounce around, hit off the heavy atoms of water, um, but just bounce off and slow down. Uh, if you use normal water, the normal water tends to absorb the free neutrons and therefore stopping the reaction. So that's why they use heavy water. Heavy water just uh, refers to um, water that contains, uh, I believe it's an extra neutron in the, uh, in the atom of the hydrogen. Um, that I believe is correct. You can check your textbook for that. Um, so yeah, the, uh, that heavy water slows down those free neutrons, um, allowing them to cause more fission. So a neutron is fired into the reactor, causing a U-235 atom that it hits to fission. 
that fission releases three more free neutrons. Those neutrons are slowed down by the moderator uh, and eventually hit another U-235 atom, causing it to split. Now we've got nine of them, nine free neutrons out there floating around. They hit, now we've got 27 free neutrons. They hit, now we've got 81 free neutrons. And we create this chain reaction. Control rods made of a material that absorbs neutrons are placed between the fuel bundles to control the chain reaction. If you didn't have those fuel bundle, or sorry, if you didn't have those control rods in between the fuel bundles, um, the reaction would get out of control and release so much energy that we would have a meltdown or a nuclear explosion like a bomb. So those control rods are slid down into, uh, in between the fuel bundles and the farther you push them into the fuel bundle, in between the fuel bundles, the more neutrons they're going to absorb and slow down the reaction. If you put them all the way in, they're going to completely stop the reaction um, and, and essentially shut down the reactor. So how far in the control rods go tells us how or allows more or less uh, nuclear fission to happen. Now, when this fission happens, a lot of energy is released, and that energy heats up that heavy water that surrounds the fuel bundles. Cold water, cold normal water, is pumped through pipes into the heavy water, heating it up. So Now, the heavy water and the normal water never mix. It's just a pipe flowing through the water that allows the heat energy to be transferred from the heavy water through the pipe, the metal of the pipe, and into the normal water, but those two waters never mix. That, wa that normal water, or light water, is uh, then pumped out of the reactor and into a steam generator, um, where, that, where steam is created, and that steam then goes through a turbine, causing it to turn and generate energy. That energy usually then, or that turbine is connected to an electromagnet, which spins the magnets in an electric field, create, causing elect, uh, electrons to travel down a wire and essentially creating electricity. The steam then, after passing through the turbine, goes into a cooling, sort of a cooling tank, where basically um, more normal water, usually from a river, an ocean, or a lake, is pumped uh, into air through pipes to absorb that heat from the steam, cooling that steam down and turning it back into into cold water um, so it can enter the, the uh, reactor again um, to pick up more heat. Then the lake water is pumped out into the lake again or the ocean or the river um, and more cold water is brought in. Again, in this case, the two waters don't mix. Um, so you never have any water that was ever in the nuclear reactor actually being pumped into the river. It's all a closed system. Um, and yeah, then the, the water, the, ste the steam that has been turned down into water goes back into the reactor to pick up more heat and the cycle continues. And that's how the CANDU reactor works. That is everything for uh, this unit. Like I said, it's a fairly short unit. Uh, good luck on your exam.